ever been listening to your favorite podcast and think, hey, I want to start my own? Then you need Anchor. It's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. First, everyone's favorite word, free. There's creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. You can even make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Hello, my beautiful people, and welcome back to the Bibliophile Hour. I am your host slash cousin, Erica the Bibliophile. And today is day 16 of Read a Book record a podcast. We are flying through these things. And today's book is a continuation of the last series, The Beauty of This Street Love, A Texas Tale. And I know I said in the Thug series, I don't like to read different series that pulls things all together. But after reading about basically all of the brothers, I had to see how Tamar's love life was going to happen and what happened to her. So let's get started. Okay, and this two-part story is called There's Still Beauty in This Street Love, Her Fallen Angel. And this is probably going to be a short episode, no lie, because this book is literally the third book all over again, just from Angel and Tamar's point of view and there's also a sprinkle of Tyrese and Dr. Rose in here as well but yeah like I said it's basically a replay of all those events so I kind of don't want to go through all of that all over again but I'm going to be speaking on Angel and Tamar's point of view. Angel Cruz is self-described as a man with no attachments he isn't looking for any relationships because he's all about work and he's a assassin murder for hire whatever you want to call it so his only way of dealing with women is just having sex with them when the urge urge hits him and you know he's trying to find a woman who could understand that it's just like when I call you up it is what it is but we're not in a relationship there's no feelings nothing and he's tried a couple times but no matter how they claim to understand what he's looking for they always end up hinting about relationships or crying and having attitudes and he's just not here for that until three weeks ago and that's when our lovely Tamar you know walked into his life and he was fascinated by her so he had gone from deciding to just having sex sex with her and then planning to wife her and Tamar is described as looking like Latoya Luckett so she's gorgeous and also being described as a flat-out gutta bitch but she was going to be his gutta bitch Angel's biological father was black and Mexican, and his mom was Afro Boricua. Before he kidnapped her in the last movie, he had got a call from a Don Carlos. Don Carlos again, but a different one, not from the Thug series. Telling him that the princess had planned to come for all of the Kinsey women. And, you know, hope to kidnap them in order to get to the Kinsey's. And he had already warned them, you know, to back off. Like, he wasn't going to let them do anything to Tamar. And he wasn't going to take the job from them. And so the night that he took her, he paid a woman to act like her and her baby were stranded and in distress. And... The two guys watching Tamar were easily distracted and that gave him enough time to hit one of them and then tranquilize the other. And then that's how he knocked out her light and, you know, fought her in the lawn 
and stuck a needle in her neck and got her back to his family's house. So that's where he kept her all that time in his family's house. And the house is owned by his grandparents. His cousin Daniel and himself, they designed the security system so he knows it's real secure and she's not going anywhere. Angel's background story is his father died when he was younger and he calls his mom a puta. I hope I'm saying that right. Who rarely let him spend time with the Cruises, which is his father's side of the family. Instead, she kept him with her and her new husband so she could split the beatings that the stepfather was handing out. And he didn't care which one of them that he hit as long as he was hitting someone until Angel started to fight back. And after that happened, the stepfather put him out and the mother went along with it. So Angel and Tamar have been at his family's home for a week or two now. And some days they talk, some days they don't. It's just very frustrating. And of course, Tamar hasn't stopped trying to escape because it's like nigga I don't know you like that and one day he's on the phone with his grandmother who he calls big mama and he's telling her about the situation some of it not everything and big mama is stuck on the fact that he has a woman there so it's just like this your girlfriend you know what's going on and he tells her big mama you got the wrong impression it's nothing like that Tamar don't even like me like that and she's a spoiled kid and of course this is when Tamar walks in and she's offended and she tells him don't be talking shit about me to your hoes first of all I can't help it if nobody cared enough about you or them to spoil you and this makes him upset and he tells her you stay letting your mouth write checks that your ass can't cash you kidnapped me now you want to complain about me then calling this bitch your favorite and he tells her you know your mouth is too vulgar and you're disrespecting the woman that I was on the phone with you don't have to keep defending your bitch to me just keep my name out your mouth and he has to tell her you know it wasn't some bitch that was my grandmother and you are a spoiled kid look at how you acted and he also tells her you need more discipline experience you too comfortable and she tells him, you get so serious about respect, but look at how you treat me. He's like, what are you talking about? I respect your space. First of all, you snatched me out of my space. I respect your hustle. You just said I needed discipline. And you, I respect your privacy because he's determined to like get some kind of, what am I trying to say? You know, like I'm doing the best that I can. And she's like, oh, so that wasn't you that walked on me in the shower the other day and he has to you know like recoup and says I do have respect for you but you have some growing to do he's t and he's 27 I think her and Tamir are 21 so there's six years difference from them but he also says but I have much much more life experience than you so that makes me much more older so it doesn't even matter the legal number Angel and Tamar come to a compromise of him trusting her enough to believe that she trusts him. So, you know, they're finally, I guess, quote unquote, getting along when he offers to let her go on a job with him. And, you know, she's excited like, yeah, but I don't want to just sit back and watch. I want to be a part. And he's like, no. And she says, if you want me to learn, I need to take parts. And he says, why? I mean, he says no, and she says why. What's the purpose of all this shit you're telling me and making me watch? If you're going to treat me like a baby the whole time, I bet I can help you. And Angel has been, has been contracted to take out a dude who specializes in luring young women from poorer are areas to pimp them out and then turn them over to a trafficking ring that's running up the I-10 in Houston. He made the mistake of snatching a rich girl who thought it was cute to hang in the hood. So very new, new from ATL. And 
Her parents had recovered her, but only after she'd been raped multiple times and forced into a heroin addiction. The family was out for blood, literally. And that also sounds like that's part of the Prince family, because that's what they did to Sed's daughter, or was attempting to do to Sed's daughter. So, um... He gives Tamar the job of trying to dress up like a young girl and lure him, you know, away from his team. Because, of course, he has bodyguards watching out for him. And so they have it set up. But before they do, he asks her, you know, why do you want to do this so bad? And she tells him, you know, because you don't think I can. You talk all this shit about what you think I can do and getting me ready. But you're just like my family. All y'all see is a pretty princess. You don't trust me to carry my weight. I'm cut from the same cloth as my brothers. I shared the womb with Tamir. I grew up in the same house with the same family doing the same business. But I ain't capable. Fuck all y'all. I'ma show y'all. And so at first he was gonna call off the whole thing, you know, not even let her do it. But she goes out and she pulls the guy and manages to get him down the street when she says that her friend lives a couple doors down and she just has to tell her that she's not going to come over tonight because she's going to get in the car with him. And they manage to get rid of the bodyguards and, you know, like zip tie him and get him in the car. And Angel was upset because she didn't totally stick to the script because she was just supposed to lure him down the street but instead at one point it looked like she was almost about to get into the car with him so he tells her i told joe has to stick to the script and she said i did no you were about to get in the car with him you hard-headed as fuck hard-headed i done told you repeatedly i'm not a fucking kid fuck you angel I did what I was supposed to do and you still talking shit. And after a few minutes, he says, you did a good job. Why can't you just say that? And he's upset because in her time of talking to the man, she called him daddy. So this nigga is jealous. And it's like, really? You couldn't just tell me I did a good job. You upset because I called this nigga daddy for a role that you asked me to play. How you sound? But niggas in logic, it never go together. So she calls him jealous and he admits it. And he says, don't ever let me hear you say no shit like that again to somebody else ever. So it was a good day. And she responds with, okay, poppy. So Andrew gets a call from his big mama wanting him to come over to dinner with the family. And she's laying it on thick saying, you know, me and your grandfather don't have that much longer to live and he's like man didn't you just tell me last week your blood pressure was good your mammogram was normal you don't have diabetes and you're up walking to six miles a day those are all earthly markers baby we never know when our heavenly father might call us home and of course you know that's his grandmother so he's not going to deny her anything and she wants him to bring his girlfriend And he doesn't tell her until, like, they're right at the door that this is his family and it's a family dinner. And my grandma thinks you're my girlfriend, so I need you to play along. And the evening is going great up until Daniel Daniel has a four-year-old daughter, Aaliyah. Now, Big Mama has a spirit of discernment. A special instinct on feeling what we can never explain or understand. And they believe that that's magnified in the little baby. So she walks up to Tamar and she's touching her face. And the whole room goes silent. And Big Mama tells her that Aaliyah is blessed with the gift of sight. And while Daniel is trying to pull the little baby away, she turns to Tamar and tells her, Angel really likes you. Even though he's going to make you cry. He likes you a lot. And Tamar looks at Angel. And he can feel her with drawing from him at that moment. And he just feels like all of his hard work. Getting her to trust him. Him learning to trust her. 
was about to be unraveled by the words of a four-year-old girl. I know you're worried about what Leah said. I don't doubt that he might cause you pain, but it won't be on purpose. Hurt people hurt people. Angel has a lot of healing to do, and he's still not comfortable with his emotions and relationships. Don't let him run you off. I can tell that he cares about you. And at that point, Tamar didn't want to hear anymore, and the conversation was over. Later that night, though, she hears, like, noises and thinks that someone is attacking Angel. But when she gets to his bedroom, she actually sees that he's caught up in the throes of a nightmare. So she tries to help him, you know, by touching his shoulder. And she realizes that that's a mistake because he grabs her and drags her to the bed and underneath him. He pins her down. And, you know, he doesn't realize that it's her because he's still in the nightmare. So his hands move from her arms to her neck and he begins to squeeze. So she's trying to use her self-defense techniques where she can break the chokehold, but they're not working. He's like deep in a rage of the nightmare and it appears like he's becoming even stronger and he's squeezing harder. So she starts to cry and, you know, scream out to him that it's me, it's me, it's Tamar. And finally, he like snaps out of it and he tells her, don't you ever come close to me when that happens. In fact, go the other way. And he tries to move her and put some distance between them, but she actually latches on and doesn't let go. And he tells her, I'm taking you back to your family's compound tomorrow. And this pisses her off because she's like, oh, now you're just ready to give up. Which is just like, sis, you should run the other way. This man just choked you out and left bruises on your neck. Like his fingerprints are in your skin and not in a good way. You know, like how we all would like, well, some of us, never mind. Um, And, you know, he's just like we need to cut this out for a little bit so she tells him i ain't going nowhere till i get ready dr rose gets a visit from one of the higher up doctors and he asks if she ever thought about administration like of course she's just getting started in her career so he knows that she's not thinking about that yet but it's it's something she should be thinking about because the chief of surgery is retiring and she's a known favorite to the patients and the staff and she's a brilliant doctor so she's someone that they have in mind and they're willing to mentor her and all she has to do is keep her exceptional practice you know keep up her good work and keep her reputation stellar you have nowhere to go but up and you know this puts her in high spirits of course, so it leads back to Tyrese and she says, could I do that? You know, keep up her stellar reputation when she was half in love with a young, wild, dope boy. And I can't stand Dr. Rose because that seems to be like she is stuck on that one thing. Like, I don't get how you call yourself being in love with somebody. You feeling him like you feeling that thug appeal, you know shout out to jc um but when it comes to your real life then it's like you gotta pull back so you playing a role because it's almost like she wants to appear to be one way while having this life in the shadows and it's just like you're not even giving him a chance like he's in college he wants to be a pharmacist this is his life right now and even with this being his life he's protecting you like nothing is coming your way you're not involved with nothing it's not affecting you in a negative way like you even made money from it at one point talking about a side hustle couldn't hurt nobody and then you get one compliment at work and could I do this with a young wild dope boy it's just like you ain't think about that any other time any other time he makes you feel good and you enjoy being with him so why are you just so quick to throw him away at the drop of a hat if that's love I don't want no parts of it 
Because what comes first? Like, is it your career or your love life? So Ty and Dr. Rose are at her house, you know, just lounging around when she randomly asks him if he wants babies. And he lets her know, I want to have kids with my wife. I don't want my shorties scattered everywhere. I want them living with me so I can take care of them, right? You ain't on no baby fever, are you? Because we can borrow my nieces in, oh, excuse me, you know, whatever Trey and Shay are about to have. And she says, no, nah, no baby fever. But in the future, do you plan to have them? And he's confused because it's just like, why is this? Like, why won't she let the topic drop? And he tells her five or six. I want my kids to be like my brothers and I crazy as hell and involved in the other world underworld no tight as hell and carrying on the family family legacy and for some reason you know like she has this look on her face but she doesn't expound on why she wants to talk about this she just says it's something she's been thinking about tamar convinces this is when tamar convinces angel to let her go to the baby shower or the gender reveal i'm sorry and there's a moment where all the brothers surround him and tell him not gonna give you no long speech or list of threats you hurt her you die you fail to protect her you die it's as simple as that and he says i understand because i feel the same way because even though they're the legendary kinsey family he feels like no one can can protect her quite like he can so it's just like the same threat y'all giving to me it goes to y'all i'm gonna make sure she's good though it's just like okay ty was on his way to see dr rose when he had got a text that storm was pulling up to the hospital and going to see her so it wasn't a surprise and he was standing outside the door while they were having that back and forth and he heard everything that both parties said so he knew that storm was putting on an act and he wasn't falling for it so once again there's silence between tamar and angel and she decides that she's gonna braid his hair but he's not saying anything and she says i hate when you get like that given one word answers and has a you know he has an extra what is it gravelly voice sounding like you had a box of rocks for lunch <laughs> and i don't know if i said that in the other reviews that his voice it's real scratchy it's a very distinct sound and anyway she says, you need to learn how to say, just mind your business. Because she's trying to ask him questions, but he's not really answering. So he says, fine, mind your business. And she asks, when are we going back to Houston? I miss being in the city. And he lets her know that he'll probably be moving her back in the next couple of days. Wait, move me back? Where are you going to be? I'll probably have to go to Puerto Rico for a few days to check on some things. How the hell are you going to take off to an island in the middle of a hurricane? You got life all fucked up. No. Two months into my birthday and you done cut me off from all my little booze. How am I supposed to rack up? Let's talk about that. Since you don't want to talk about anything else. I mean, my man was letting me live up in New York for a couple of weeks to celebrate the end of the semester. But then Mir got shot and all this drama. I got to catch up. And he like flips the script on her. And says, by your main, I'm assuming you mean that pre Scott nigga. I've already warned that fuck boy, fuck boy, if he ever tries to date you again, he won't live to finish law school. Must let much less inherit his daddy's money. So now my little wannabe sugar baby, you can play with his life and all your little booze if you want to. I'll dead all them niggas. And she had nothing to say <laughs> about that. But then she got upset because she says, you won't touch me. And you won't let nobody else. Where they do that at? And he says, it's not time. I still got shit to do. If we do it now, you're going to be mad in a few days when I leave. I got a lot of shit to settle before I can be with you like that. But that don't mean you entertain other niggas letting him aspire to take my spot. 
I don't call you my reina for nothing, which is queen in Spanish. My spot is beside you, with you. And after that, after she braids his hair, she makes him help her take her hair down. And he opens up just a little bit, telling her about his relationship with his grandmother, who he adores. And then she asks about his mom's people and it gets really awkward and she almost starts to cry because it's just like she feels as if she ruined the moment between them but he lets her know that he's not mad and that his mother is a puta not even worth talking about his biological parents met in houston when his mother camilla moved down there for a little bit when she was in high school they got married as soon as they graduated Big Mama had a bad feeling, but everybody thought it was because she didn't want to see her baby boy grow up. He came along in the second year of their marriage, and when he was four, Camilla was pregnant again. No, when he was four, Camilla convinced him to move to New York, where she's from. And Big Mama said she knew he'd never live in Houston again. And it turns out that she had moved to, Camilla had moved to Houston because she got caught messing around with a married rich man. But his wife had all the money and she threatened to divorce divorce him, then expose him because Camilla was just 15 or 16. So he was a pedophile. And I don't, it's J-O-S-U-E, Josu or Hozu, because you know it's Spanish, Hozu gave Camilla some money to move away and keep her mouth closed. So as soon as Camilla found out that Hosu's wife died in some sort of accident, she was ready to move to be close to him. She could have left my father and me here, but she wanted to make sure that she was taken care of either way. So it's like she convinces his father to move to New York, basically so she can cheat on him and creep around with Hosu. I know because I remember when she took me with her sometimes to creep with this nigga. Like, Camilla just, she is a puta. Not long after that, my dad died in some freak accident while he was working in the backyard. You think? I know. You can't tell me nothing different. They killed him. Hosu probably killed his wife too. Camilla didn't even wait six months to marry him. But she should have been careful what she wished for. We moved to Puerto Rico to a little bitty town where he had family and connections. He beat her ass for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Beat her so bad one time she miscarried. Then she miscarried when the baby was almost due. And then he started beating me. She never tried to stop him. Not just because she was scared. She hated me. She blamed me for the way Hozu treated her. Her, According to Camilla, he couldn't stand having a reminder that she had been with someone else. She told me every day how miserable our fucking lives were, our, were my fault. She wished I'd never been born, how much she hated me. Of course, she could have sent me to stay with Big Mama permanently, but she wanted me miserable like her. I got big quick. By the time I was 11 or 12, I could fight his ass back. One day when I was 14 or 15... He tried his luck. I walked in on him beating Camilla and broke it up. He tried to turn on me, but I fucked him up. Me being a stupid kid stayed there that night. He had a piece of bo uh, of wire, I was going to say barbed wire, tied around my neck so tight that it cut into my skin. It crushed my uh, larynx. I got free and knocked his ass out. The wire still on me. I staggered into the room with Camilla. I fell on her bed, almost unconscious, reaching out to her. I'll never forget. She just looked at me. She looked at me and said, you always somewhere making shit worse. And turned her back. I had to make it to the neighbors. Next thing I remember is waking up in the hospital. All the shit was covered up. They claim he acted in self-defense. I blacked both of his eyes and messed up his jaw. Hozu decided I had to leave. I wouldn't have gone back to the house anyway. They shipped me back to New York. I wilded out for a few years, robbing niggas, trying to stay off the streets. Then I called my big mama. And when she talked to him on the phone, all big mama said was, baby, come home. And so now we finally have insight on his background and 
his life but i don't understand how that would make him not want to be in a relationship because if you see how a relationship could be i would think that would inspire you how not to be and you learn from those experiences and you move on but of course everybody isn't like that so i'm not assuming every person to be that way but it just seems like he uses his as a crutch even though he doesn't tell people his story and won't talk about it but it's just like you are holding on to this in a way that you could simply let it go and so tamar thinks that he's going to risk his life in a hurricane for them and he says for camilla hell no she could stay with that nigga and until it's the right circumstance a uh, set of circumstances where i can kill him they could stay right where they are but his days are numbered when Hurricane Maria finally lands on Puerto Rico, he just turns to her and tells her to pack. How you even going to get there? Who going to risk their private plane? What pilot is going to risk their life? You're not thinking. At least wait. I'm leaving in a few days. You're going back to the city. This conversation is over. And, you know, while he's dropping her off, she doesn't say anything. And he has a key to her house. So he opens the door, excuse me, and goes in first, you know, so he can check it out. And they can tell that things have been messed with. Like her house isn't trashed as if they thrown it around. But it wasn't the way that it was before he got her to come stay with him. So he tells her to go back in the car while he reaches for his Glock. But of course she grabs her gun and she follows right behind him. So aside for, from most of the same slight disorder upstairs, there was nothing to find. So he told her to grab what she wanted to take and let's go. And by noon, he had them set up in a lavish apartment near the museum just district, wherever that is, in Houston. And six days later, she woke up and just knew. He left when she was asleep, despite the fact that she had crawled in the bed with him every night, you know, basically trying to stop him from going, or she would know when he left. And despite the fact that he was worried for her safety, because, you know, somebody had been in her house, he still left. And he left her a note saying, Raina, I'll be back as soon as I can. Don't worry. I have your car. I had your car delivered. So that's all he had to say. Dr. Rose and Tyrese are going to her parents' house for dinner. But when they get there, Dr. Rose notices that there's six settings. And that's who else is coming. And her mom says Eric and a friend. Now, Eric is her brother who has been dealing with drugs for a long, long time. And they almost lost their house because he jumped bail. And that was right around the time she had started working for Ty. So she was able to save their house with the extra money that she was bringing in. But he just stays in trouble with Xanax, opioids, and alcohol. And she looks at her mom kind of giving her a look like, really? He coming here for dinner? And she tells her, don't ask me to give up on my child. Eric walks in with a young lady who looks really young. And Briar looks from him to the girl. And the girl is very much pregnant. And while they're having dinner... Um, it becomes apparent that Eric is also living there. Well, him and his girlfriend are living with her parents. And her mom says, just until he gets on his feet, I'm not having my son and grandchild in the streets. He can't even afford a place to stay. And he having a baby with a child? I'm almost 19. Like I said, with a child. And we gonna sit here and act like it ain't an issue? We gonna sit here and act like it ain't none of our damn business. You know, Tyrese had to put his two cents in and trying to put his foot down. Like, yeah, you're not happy with this, but, you know, this is your parents and this is your brother. That's their child. So mind your business. And she says, this is my business. We already know how this going to end. And her mom says, no, we don't. Unlike you, some of us have faith, Briar, Elise. A baby needs stability and consistency. And by this time, her brother has had enough because he's trying to defend himself, saying, you know, I'm trying. I've been clean for two months. And he tells her, you act like you're Dr. Perfect, like you do everything right. But you mad because I got the one thing you want. 
because you're not so perfect after all. And this is when her dad interjects and says, enough. But by that time, she's done. And she looks at Ty and says, take me home. Please take me home. Her brother tries to apologize, but she's not trying to hear none of that. And Ty doesn't even fully understand what's going on because it's just like, what is he talking about? Like, what can the drug addicted brother have that you don't have? Tamar has been moping around and been in her feelings ever since Angel left. And she's like snapping on everybody. And when they finally have enough, they drag her out the house and, you know, party or whatever. So they're all at their parents' house hanging out in the game room. And when she finally has gotten over him, because, you know, when they've been out all day, so she's feeling good. Then her dad pops in. And tells her that she has company and Angel is standing behind him. And she says, I'm sorry you wasted your time, Daddy, but can you show him back out? Thanks. And Angel says that won't be necessary. And it won't be necessary because I'm not leaving without you. So at that point, Tamir, Tripp, and Trey stand up, you know, preparing to go over to him. But their dad, like, holds up a hand and says no. Daddy Kenzie leads Angel and Tamar out into the hallway and says, look, you've been moping around here sad faced over this nigga. If I thought you really wanted him gone, I'd let him and your brothers do whatever. But I wouldn't have even let him in hell. But you gonna have them get into it when you gonna end right back up with him? All that ain't even necessary. And he walks away. Tamar tells Angel he needs to leave. And he tells her, no, nah, you need to come home. You're not gonna insist on being in my life when you just walk away, and you won't even you won't even apologize. I can't apologize because I can't be sorry for doing what I have to do, Raina. I hate the way you feel right now, but I'm not sorry for what I did. I can let your hands go, and you can hit me all night if it makes you feel better, but I'm not apologizing, and I'm not going home without you. So what are we gonna do? And we get a little background of Dr. Rose. She had went off to college when she was 14. While she was in college, she ignored the symptoms in her body. And she didn't think much of a pain that was near her belly button. She just thought it was PMS. And her stomach seemed a little bloated. But over some days, it grew worse. And, if, and she finally complained to her aunt, who took her to the clinic the next day or promised to take her to the clinic the next day but her appendix ruptured that night the uh, ugh, okay the infection it caused spread through her abdomen and caused scarring of her fallopian tubes tubes she was lucky to be both alive and devastated because her chances to become pregnant were almost destroyed and being with Ty, with his huge family, and even the discussion of asking him if he wanted kids, is bringing back that fear and those insecurities that she has. So she doesn't know what to do. So it's, and I'm not trying to downplay her situation and what's going on, but it's almost like this is also another excuse where you can pull yourself away from him, but you're not willing to talk about it. And I kind of hate that because it's like as much as she tries to make herself appear, I'm a doctor and I'm so mature and I'm so smart, but you can't have basic conversations and discuss your emotions. So how smart are you? How mature are you? While Tamar and Angel are out at the movies, Angel gets a call from Don Carlos saying that they have a situation and he takes Tamar with him. And in his office, Don Carlos's office, there sits a tied and fresh bruises on his face, Alonzo Prince. So they both immediately reach for their guns because it's like, you know that we have a problem with them and you just got him sitting here, even if he is a uh, zip tied with his hands in front of him. What does that mean? And... He says, Don Carlos, excuse me, says, when the princes robbed your family, they indirect, indirectly robbed me. But after a long, fruitful conversation, which, of course, led to the bruises on his face, I believe him when he says he's not behind the war with your family. 
So how do you explain the hit that I know you put out on her before? Because you contracted me to do it. And Alonzo swears that wasn't him. He didn't talk to him. And Angel still ain't going. He like, I've talked to your son multiple times to approve hits that you wanted. And he says, yeah, but it wasn't me this time. It was my son. Like my own son kidnapped me. And Tamar is taken back because she didn't even know that there was a hit out on her life. So it's like when Angel met up with Trey and Tripp and told them about the hit, of course, the Kinsey's wanting to protect her didn't say anything to her about it. So it's just like, nigga, I'm lying with you and you was paid to kill me? And he's like, not right now. It's like, no, this is like the perfect time. But, you know, um, Tamar was the one who said, we have to take him to my family so they can get some answers. And then that's when Angel called Trey in the uh, strip club. And Trey was like, see if baby sis will let you out tonight. And that's how they got all caught up with him. Shamar's phone starts to ring and that's when this is around the time when Trip, Sin are going to Aaron because he has baby Sinai and this is when Sinai calls her and she says TT I'm scared I think I should call 911 my mommy was crying and my daddy's head is bleeding my daddy Aaron had a gun and you know Shamar is she gonna make a great parent she's like very soothing, just trying to get answers out of her and not make her even more scared. And she also says, Daddy said he had an accident and Mama told me to go to bed and she would come tuck me in, but she's not here yet. I'm scared. And Shamar tells her, you're doing so good, baby. You were smart to call me for help. Keep being brave. You don't have to call 911. All your uncles are going to come help. So Daddy talked to you even though his head was bleeding. Because, you know, when they first heard that his head was bleeding, you would think like, oh, he got shot in the head. And it's like, fuck, my brother's dead. So they all just going into action while Shamar is still on the phone. So when she asks that question, the whole room just stops. And she says, "Mm mm-hmm. He said, it's going to be all right, Ladybug. So that lets them know that he's still alive or still hanging on. And so when they get there... Tay wanted to be the first one to like go in, but Trey and Angel told her hell no, cause they're like the they're the assassins. They can shoot from a long ways away, so they got there first. And this is when Sin fell into Ty's arm, just crying. And they got everybody settled down, and you know got the family back, killed all the other people, and everything is great. And then they're at the mall, like the whole crew is at the mall getting ready for Trip and Sin's wedding. And inside the baby store, Ty, Tyrese comes up to Dr. Rose and tells her, I think Storm is following you. She's here again. So it's just like wherever Dr. Rose may seem to be, Storm is also there. And it's like, what? And you didn't think to tell me this? So Tamar and Angel are finally gonna have sex and she says I know I said I had a lot of little booze but that didn't mean I was sleeping with them I only slept with two of them so their intimate moment was much more special to her and she tells him I love you and then he stiffens and quickly like leaves and goes into the bathroom gets cleaned up and comes back out And she says, it's okay. I know you don't believe in that soft shit. I guess it was just the sex that had my head gone. So, of course, he takes offense to it. But it's just like, nigga, what am I supposed to do? You just, like, withdrew from me and left and then come back. And now you think we're going to talk about it? No, we good. I'm going to try to play this off the best way I can. Fuck you. So, at the wedding, Devin walks Sin down the aisle Cause you know, her parents ain't shit. And when the pastor asks who gives this woman away, when Devin was supposed to speak, Sanai Lil' Cute Self says, me. And I thought that was so cute. I just wanted to mention that. And so there's a guy at their reception. His name is Jordan, I believe. 
And he says Tripp took him to a 10 acre property and told him that he wants to, he wants them to design their home. So that was his present to send at their reception. They are building their very own dream home. And this is her happily ever after because she went from neglected daughter to ignored single mother to beloved wife. So that's their happy ending. And she's pregnant with their baby. So, you know, their little family is complete. And Storm shows up again. And Dr. Rose asks her, Storm, what are you doing here? The girl ignored her. This small package obviously packed a powerful punch. I felt the tension all around me. I saw Trey making his way towards us. And, you know, since he's the Kinsey enforcer, something about Storm must need enforcing. And Daniel, who is part of security, says that she had one of the reception invitations that Sin handed out to her fans. Because, you know, she's on Instagram. She popping. So he didn't see a problem with it. But he's like, is there a problem? And Storm says she just came to tell the family congratulations. The Kinseys are growing with the marriages and the babies. It'll be your turn soon. Good luck, though. You're going to need it with your defective doctor. I'm sure she hasn't mentioned that she probably can't give you the family that she wanted. And it's like, what? How did she even know this information to bust her out like that? And... You know, Dr. Rose is messed up and she leaves because it's just like the way Ty looked at her, all her fears are coming true. So this was basically the out that she needed. So Angel is in the background as he normally is watching Tamar smile and party with her family at the reception. Then he gets a text message and he tells Trey to tell her that he had to go. And it's been 82 days. Tamar, even though she tried not to count, tried to forget about him, she couldn't. 82 days in which she had to smile through her birthday. Well, her and Tamir's birthday, Tay's birthday. And he wasn't too happy because of his situation with Dr. Rose. Christmas and New Year. The baby girl, Noah's first birthday. Her parents' anniversary. And she had to do it all by herself. She started spending nights at Shay and Trey's house, you know, to keep her and Shay from being lonely. And Trey had to work. So he's been doing a lot of work. And, you know, she, oh, excuse me. Shamar is still pregnant and they're talking. She gets up to go get some milk and you hear glass break. So Tay gets up to go see and Shamar is on the floor. Her water broke and she got scared, so she slipped and fell. So they rush her to the hospital, get her into, um, you know, the baby room, baby delivery room, whatever it's called. And their little boy comes out fine. And Shamar is so busy trying to look at one baby. The doctor tells her, I need you to focus because you got to keep pushing. And when she starts to push, the monitor begins to beep at a high level and she's in distress and they might have to move to a c-section and she lets go of trey's hand and her eyes get heavy and then you hear trey yell why is there so much blood what did you do to them and the doctor says i need you to stay i need you to stay with us shamar but she couldn't everything was fading and then absolutely nothing and that's the way this book ends and, you know, when I was first reading this, I was so scared for my girl. It's just like, girl, what is going to happen to our little Shamar and the other baby? Like, everybody know Trey crazy. So, you know, if his baby don't make it or his girl, Houston, Texas ain't even a state no more. It's over. But, yeah, I hope to see you guys back tomorrow for part two. And, like I said, this shouldn't be very long because there wasn't a lot to it. It was... Just a complete retelling of the same story, just in a different point of view. But part two is better, in my opinion. We get a little bit more into Angel and Tamar. 
But I didn't like the, the thing that I didn't like because I don't like relationships like this. It's just like there's so much drama and then they're not even together that often. So it's like, is it a relationship? Is this a love story? Because it's under the category of romance. But it's just like, there's not really any romance. And that's just my opinion. I still like the book. I still read it. I still give it a thumbs up. It was a book that I enjoyed because it was part of the series. And like I said, I couldn't leave Tamar out. I had to see how her love story goes. But in my opinion, it seemed like she had it worse than anybody else. Like her brother's basically smooth sailing compared to all the shit she got to go through with somebody who is described just as bad as Trey. But in my opinion, he's worse than Trey because Trey gives it to you head up. Angel is trying to hide in the dark. And it's just like, why would you force your way into her life if this is what you're going to do to it? You could have just stayed away until you had yourself together, then come back and try to court and date her. But you just basically want to put her on the shelf till you ready for her. It don't work like that. But anyway, yes. I am out of here. And I hope you guys enjoyed this episode. It took me hell to make it. Peace and blessings, my beautiful people.